Welcome everyone to Atlantis, the first hybrid tech summit event. We have people connected in 16 Google offices for watch parties all across EMEA. Today we're in for a treat. We're going to talk to an internet pioneer who will give us a glimpse into the future of interplanetary internet and share what can be what can the evolution of the internet teach us, how it all started, and what's the next big milestone. Before I introduce you, I wanted to share with you an interesting fact. Our guest was born on June 23, 1943. Also on June 23, another person was born, Alan Turing, who is considered to be the father of theoretical computer science and artificial intelligence. I found it extremely interesting that the father of, of an invention that changed our lives forever shares his birthday with the father of theoretical computer science and AI. Our next guest, Vince Cerf, needs no introduction. He is the vice president and chief internet evangelist for Google. An interesting fact about him is that he advocates and works on assistive technology and assistive situations. He sponsors accessibility for Google products and services early in the product design process. Also, Vint is a huge sci-fi fan, so I looked up the Wikipedia definition for that. Imaginative and futuristic concepts, advanced science and technology, space exploration, time travel, parallel universes, extraterrestrial life, and more. All of that I found very powerful since this directly applies to his groundbreaking work on technologies and applications of the internet. Before we kick it off, I'd like to share with you one more thing about Vint. Remember that Alan Turing and Vint were born on the same day? Well, they have one more thing that connects them. Vint was also awarded the highly prestigious ACM Turing Award, also known as the Nobel Prize for Computing. Wow. Without further ado, let me introduce you to the father of the internet, Dr. Vinton G. Cerf, Vice President and Chief Internet Evangelist at Google. Welcome. How are you today? Well, good morning or good afternoon or good evening, depending on where you and everyone else happens to be when this uh, video is played. Thanks so much for inviting me on the show. I really appreciate it. I wanted to make two points, though, about your introduction. Yeah, thank you very much for that. Very kind words. First of all, Alan Turing was born in 1912, and I was born in 1943. So I'm not uh, 100 and some odd years old, even if I look that way. Uh, so that first point. But it is, it is indeed a wonderful irony that, uh, that he and I share a birth date. Um, it turns out that the, the Turing Award has gone to others at Google as well. As you may know, uh, John Hennessy and David Patterson uh, received the Turing Award for their development of risk uh, architecture uh, not too long ago. So, uh, and Larry, Larry Page and uh, Sergey Brin have been awarded other uh, very significant recognitions like the Marconi Prize. So we have lots of, of, uh, of winners at Google, uh, as are all the people that I think who work here. Definitely. And also you have been awarded many other uh, prestigious honors and medals, but you know, we don't have three and a half hours to cover no. that. So. No, people can Google <laughs> that if they want to. That's, that's fine. Great. That's, that's great. So really great to have you. Thanks for taking the time to, to talk to us today. Um, I just wanted to kick it off. Uh, could you tell us about the current state of the interplanetary internet program led by the IPN SIG? I mean, that's kind of the most interesting uh, topic that I think we're going to have and cover today. Well, thanks so much for asking that. I've got a few slides that I'd like to share with you. Uh, so let's, uh, let's just have a look at these. Uh, we call this the solar system internet. Sometimes we call it the interplanetary internet. Uh, but this project uh, was, uh, was started uh, in 1998, just after uh, the, um, the Pathfinder project landed on Mars and, and brought with it a little robot called Sojourner in 1997. Now, I should tell you that the uh, exploration of Mars uh, has been going on for quite a while. There were flybys, for example. And then we had two landers, uh, Viking 1 and 2, in 1976, very successful U.S. landers, followed by 20 years of total failures. Nothing worked until finally this little Sojourner uh, uh, robot was landed in the Pathfinder mission in 1997. <clears throat> so my colleagues and I at the Jet Propulsion Lab got together in 1998. And we thought, what should we be doing in 1998 
that we were, are going to need 25 years later. And we decided we should be beginning the design of a solar system internet. And so we thought, well, uh, TCP IP seems to work okay on Earth, so it would probably work okay on Mars. And then we started to do the math, and we realized that even when we're closest together, we're 35 million miles apart. And the speed of light is so slow. It's 186,000 miles a second. It takes three and a half minutes at the speed of light for a radio signal or, or a laser to reach Mars. The propagation delay is that long. At and the closest point, probably. Yeah, yeah, it's just astonishing. And then, of course, the round trip time is double that. And when we're farthest apart in our orbits, it's 235 million miles. So that's 20 minutes one way and 40 minutes round trip. So can you imagine trying to do TCP flow control with a 40 minute round trip time? Or what the about the size would just get you? I mean, think about DNS lookup. You know, you, you do a DNS lookup from Mars trying to look up the IP address of something on Earth. And by the time you get the answer back 40 minutes later, if you're lucky, uh, the IP address has changed because the thing you were talking to was mobile and it got a different IP address because it went into some other roaming territory. So none of the conventional TCP IP designs really work well with a regime whose parameters are so extreme. So we decided that we are really faced with what we call now delay and disruption tolerant networking or DTN for short. And we started working on a new protocol we call the bundle protocol, which has the same kind of layered architecture that the internet does. It has a flat naming scheme and uh, at each hop in a store and forward system, uh, you have to do a relookup to figure out where the next hop is uh, in, the, in the system until you finally get to the destination. One of the other things that's different about the bundle protocol compared to the IP layer, which is, is the analog of, is that we actually store information in the network. And you go, why would we do that? Well, imagine that you're on your way to Jupiter, uh, trying to send data to Jupiter, and, and you're going through the Mars relay. You get to the Mars relay, but the Mars relay can't see the Jupiter relay yet because it's in orbit around Jupiter and it's behind the planet. In the uh, traditional internet, you throw stuff away when you don't have a next hop. In the interplanetary system, you store it. And the reason that those are different, uh, partly out of sheer pragmatics, I mean, why would you throw stuff away after going to all the trouble of getting to Mars? But in the original internet design, memory was really expensive. And so we couldn't afford to hang on to stuff until things uh, uncertainly would come back uh, into connectivity. So we threw everything away and said, you can retransmit end to end. And remember the latencies are fairly low in the terrestrial uh, internet, but that's not true for the interplanetary system. So storing in the network is different. Another thing which uh, is very notable is that because of the high and variable delays, ping is not your friend. I mean, normally in the uh, ter terrestrial internet, you send a ping to find out if something's there or not. But in the interplanetary system, you have no idea how long it's going to be before the ping comes back and or even whether it's going to come back. So you have to rethink your entire network management architecture to assume that it is not a very interactive system. And finally, uh, the first thing I said to my colleagues was that I do not want to see a headline that says 15 year old takes over MarsNet. And so I insisted that we put in very strong authentication and encryption. Uh, in the system from the get-go as opposed to waiting as we did in the case of the internet. The project, which has started, as I say, in 1998, has been uh, undergoing standardization since that time in two different places, the Consultative Committee on Space Data Systems, which is made up of all the spacefaring nations of the world, and the Internet Engineering Task Force, which does standards for the internet. Both of them have reached a uh, conclusion uh, on the standardization of the bundle protocol and the lick lighter transmission protocol and other things that are associated with interplanetary internet. Literally just uh, this, uh, this year, we finalized bundle protocol version seven in the Internet Engineering Task Force. So uh, as many of you will know, a number of successful missions have arrived uh, at Mars since the 1997 arrival of the Pathfinder mission. Uh, and uh, the original work uh, was started by a small team that I've listed here at the beginning. Uh, we, we were very far along in our design of the bundle protocol in 2004 when Spirit and Opportunity landed on Mars. And the original plan was to transmit data directly 
to Earth from the surface of Mars to what's called the Deep Space Network, which is 370 meter antennas that are in three places around the Earth uh, in, in order to see what's out there in the solar system and communicate uh, with our spacecraft. So the ideal is to transmit data from the surface of Mars from the rovers at a blazing 28.5 kilobits a second. Well, the radio's overheated, and don't ask me why we didn't notice that in testing beforehand. I have no idea. Uh, but that meant we should reduce the duty cycle to keep the radios from overheating or from uh, harming any of the instruments that were on board. And of course, at this point, the scientists are really grumpy because 28.5 kilobits was bad enough. Now we got to back off on the duty cycle. So then one of the, uh, the JPL engineers said, well, you know, we have an X-band radio on the rovers. And we sent orbiters to Mars two years before that in order to map the surface of Mars to figure out where the rover should go. And the orbiters are still operational. They still have communications capability, computing capability, and, and power. So why don't we reprogram the rovers and the orbiters to do store and forward networking? We'll use a, uh, a prototype system called the Consultative Committee on Space Data Systems File Delivery Protocol, or CFDP. So we uploaded software to the rovers and to the orbiters in order to outfit this store and forward network, which is packet switching. That's how the internet works. So they've been doing manual um, uh, file delivery protocol since 2004 for all of the rovers and landers that have successfully uh, arrived at Mars since that time. And they're using what's called contact graph routing, which just basically means the rover on the ground waits until the orbiter gets overhead, transmits the data up, and then the orbiter holds on to the data until it gets to the right point in its orbit to transmit data back to, um, back to Earth to the deep space network. So that's basically where we are right now, fully standardized operations on the International Space Station. A number of groups are busy working on... Uh, uh, on the uh, inter on the interplanetary internet, and we are preparing uh, to uh, return to the moon, as many of you will know, and we will bring with us the interplanetary protocol suite. So I'll stop sharing my slides here, uh, and we can go back to our regularly scheduled Q and A. So. Uh... Thanks for, for a great introduction on that. I think I want to call out a few things that I found super uh, interesting. First thing is that uh, you guys had started to design this pretty close to when the internet was really launched, right? So around the, uh, in the 80s, where the internet was really turned on, right? Between the 70s and the 80s. So that's kind of pretty advanced. And well, well, making... well, wait a minute now. Let's, let's get our, our timeline straight. Internet design starts in 1973, Bob Kahn and me, you know, two hands on one pencil. Uh, then we published the, the spec in 1974. Then we spent all of 74 doing detailed design. Then we spent all of 75 implementing TCP. Then we discovered in 76 that we should split TCP and IP out and, and introduce UDP. And then we worked like crazy to get it implemented on as many operating systems as possible. And we turn it on in 1983. Okay, so the internet is running in 1983. The first Financial packet sent is 1983, and yeah. it's based on the RFC 675 that has been designed in 1974. That's correct. In December 1974 is when we published RFC 675. But then uh, from 1983 until 1988, uh, we saw an expansion of the internet with the U.S. research agencies, so the National Science Foundation, NASA, and the Department of Energy joined ARPA, the Department of Defense, in building backbone networks. So we had four backbone networks uh, that were operating internet. But in 1988, it turned out that uh, no one was allowed to use the internet other than those who were supported by those research agencies. It was purely for research. No commercial traffic permitted. And I thought, well, that's terrible. You know, How do we get this into commercial hands so that there'll be an economic engine to support the growth of the net and allow it to be accessed by uh, the general public and the private sector. You need to adjust the incentives, right? So that it, it could carry well, itself. Well, you know, you could, you could hear the Senator saying, we don't want the commercial traffic to use our government resources to, you know, but I said, well, wait a minute, you know, there's a lot of reasons why you might want the private sector to communicate for research purposes. So I asked permission in 1988, 
to connect the MCI mail commercial email system to the internet as an experiment. Of course, my real purpose was to break the appropriate use policy that said no commercial traffic on the backbones. And they said, okay. So in 89, we connected MCI mail to the internet, made a big announcement, and all the other email guys, you know, with the telemail and on time and uh, CompuServe and others said, wait a minute, wait a minute, we want to be in on this deal. So they got connected to the internet. And then they discovered that their little private fiefdoms, you know, that were, were basically walled gardens, suddenly everybody in every, every walled garden could communicate with everybody else through the internet because they all met the same standards. That was a little shocking. And then in that same year, three commercial internet services uh, were started in operation in the US, uh, PSINet, UUNet, and SurfNet. So we had three commercial internet services starting in 1989. And then two years later, Tim Berners-Lee introduces the World Wide Web, which not too many people notice until Mark Andreessen and Eric Bina released the Mosaic graphical user interface browser uh, from, uh, at the time, the National Center for Supercomputer Applications. And then, uh, of course, Netscape Communications gets started when Jim Clark says, wait a minute, this is a big deal. And then the next year in 95, they go public and the stock goes through the roof and the dot boom is on. So that's another a, scale event, right? That's a little capsule history up to the uh, beginning of, of this century. And it kind of feels that we're on the verge of another one, of another event in, in that in that magnitude. Um, pr pretty amazing. Um, all right, so so you mentioned the bundle protocol. So um, could you maybe cover again that what is a disruption disruption tolerant network, and how is it really different from our common networking stack that we use here on Earth? Well, first of all, the disruption tolerance system, at least the bundle protocol version of it, stores information in the network until links come back up again. Uh, and it, uh, it does very different network management system because of the round trip time delays being so long and variable. Uh, it's more autonomous uh, operation. You send a whole bunch of instructions to some distant router uh, in the interplanetary network, and then it works on that stuff alone or independently rather than lots of interaction and handshaking. Uh, we also introduced uh, cryptography and strong authentication as a core part of the protocol from the beginning. So that's Having... baked into the platform, right? Say again? That's baked into the that's protocol baked, stack. That's baked into the bundle routers uh, as, as so that each bundle router can validate all, all the others that it's communicating with rather than uh, you know having to just trust it. Uh, and we're, as you can tell, in the internet, uh, terrestrial internet, we're learning a lot of lessons about that and we're applying them uh, into the interplanetary design as well. Absolutely amazing. And I think that's, uh, it solves a lot of issues before we even hit them, right? Obviously, we don't have to trust the application that is kind of decentralized to do the encryption, for example, and the authentication and so forth. And I think that's it's interesting. So... Um, I'm curious to, to know, you're working with so many different groups and organizations. So how challenging and also how political it is to, to have everyone agree and try to steer these groups into the right direction? Well, you know, I, I tell all my engineers that uh, the most important thing they can learn uh, to do is to sell their ideas. Because <laughs> if you can't sell your ideas, nobody is going to help you. And if you want to do anything big, you need help. And so, you know, I know that for a fact. So <clears throat> I spent a lot of my time trying to convince people they want to do what I want to do. And um, sometimes it works. And in the case of the interplanetary net, a group, a small group of us, whose names I, I showed earlier, uh, were all fired up thinking we, we could start working on this, knowing that the, if it comes to fruition 25 years later, it will be timely. And I have to tell you, it's amazing how, how timely it is. Uh, I'm sure that, that you're aware that the, the return to the moon uh, is underway. Uh, there is something called the Artemis mission, at least that's what NASA is, is working on, and the Gateway mission, which is an adjunct to it. It's sort of like an international space station, but it's in an eccentric orbit around Earth so that you could sort of take an elevator to, uh, uh, to the moon and then go back and forth from the, uh, from the moon surface to the Gateway when it comes back around again. Uh, so those missions are well planned and underway, and I would expect to see the first launches coming in the next couple of years. So we're all very excited about this early opportunity to test the interplanetary networking uh, system. 
Um, and of course, as I mentioned earlier, we actually have the prototype software running already uh, in the vicinity of Mars. Interesting. So, uh, and, and also, I mean, the, the kind of the race back to the moon, uh, to put boots on the moon, as they say, or kind of rovers on the moon is, is pretty global. So we even have a local team in Israel working on that. Uh, mm -hmm. I mean, failing for now, but, you know, failure is part of the process in progress. So uh, super exciting. Um, so uh, another question I had is, um, so talking about machine learning and artificial intelligence. So first of all, if, I mean, I want to know if and how ML and AI is leveraged for the interplanetary project. So, I mean, I mean it, are the protocols using it? For example, do we use it to generate real like traffic and data to push it through the protocol stack to see where it leaks and how it works and how it kind of handles that amount of data? Well, for the protocols themselves do not make use of AI or machine learning, <clears throat> but there are applications that do. Uh, and in fact, to give you a very concrete example, there has been an announcement as of today that an organization called B612, which was started by a former Googler and former astronaut, Ed Liu, has used our platform and machine learning capability and their, uh, their software in order to identify asteroids which have not yet been, had not yet been identified. Now, I think everyone here might appreciate that uh, we are at risk that some of these asteroids might collide with Earth because some of them already have. And of course, the famous one is 65 million years ago that uh, hit in the uh, Mexican uh, Gulf, of, Gulf of Mexico region and basically killed all the uh, dinosaurs and a lot of other life forms on the planet. So that we are at risk that another such uh, collision could occur. And so the idea is to try to be aware of that in advance. So then in order to do that, you have to know where are the asteroids, what are their orbits, and how might those orbits shift over time. So the B612 organization has just used machine learning against an enormous number of images of the sky to discover 104 new asteroids that we didn't know about, uh, none of which, as far as I know, is scheduled to hit the Earth uh, anytime soon anyway. Uh, but our intent is to try to continue the program to identify the other some 15,000 that have not yet been identified that we estimate are still out there. There's another mission, uh, which is a double strike mission, uh, which is uh, also underway uh, in order to uh, collide, send a spacecraft to collide with an asteroid to, and then to measure the impacts effect on that asteroid's orbit in order to get some sense for whether we could cause a potential collision to be deflected by changing the orbit of the uh, impacting asteroid. Uh, so you can see that, uh, that we're trying very hard at Google and at B612 and at NASA uh, to uh, at least be more prepared than we would have been in the past to identify and possibly defend against an asteroidal collision. Obviously, that's kind of the biggest risk to, for our species and, and, and therefore kind of uh, a lot of engineers and our entrepreneurs are kind of trying to tackle that in different ways. So, you know, another one would think, let's try and, you know, get on Mars and, and continue our species kind of uh, over there. Right. So, well, that's what Elon Musk uh, believes that we should be a multi-planet species in case we screw up the Earth. Uh, the one thing I should mention is to tie the uh, B612 effort into machine learning, because they used machine learning algorithms to identify a um, possible um, asteroid and then to predict where it should be if they've correctly identified its orbit. And so they used machine learning tools in order to make those predictions and then to adjust when they didn't come out uh, as they expected. So they're using those machine learning mechanisms in order to discover and track additional uh, asteroids from the ones that they, in, in, in addition to the ones they've already identified. That's an interesting application of, of ML for that. And I kind of thought that, I mean, I don't know how they would do that back in the day without having kind of the advanced technologies and tooling to, to map it out. It would be very manual and, and Sisyphic, right? Well, uh, it, it, it would be impossible because of the amount of data involved. I mean, literally, you know, billions of, of images, uh, of, you know, points of light. 
uh, some of which are stars and some of which are distant galaxies and some of which are asteroids, but you can only tell by looking at successive imagery and seeing which of the various points moved and did they move in a way that is consistent with being uh, in some kind of solar orbit. So I mean, it really, the amount of computation involved is enormous and couldn't be done without platforms like uh, the Google Cloud. Definitely. All right, so moving on to an another question that I found interesting is that, um, what was an unexpected development in the interplanetary internet, uh, internet mission that you kind of didn't anticipate? It was possibly an interesting, cause an interesting outcome. Well, I think that uh, we found ourselves uh, struggling to divorce ourselves from everything we knew about the internet. And the, the reason is that the internet it operates in a relatively low latency environment. And so a lot of our intuitions about ideas that would work uh, and do work in low latency don't work very well in highly variable latency. So the network management in particular was quite a major rethinking effort. How do I, how do I manage these far flung, <laughs> literally far flung resources when I don't have uh, reliable and low latency ability to communicate with them? Uh, you know how you see these science fiction movies where somebody's in orbit around Titan and, and there's a problem and you have them communicating in real time, you know, Houston, we have a problem. Well, of course, that's totally unrealistic because it might take, you know, minutes to hours to communicate back and forth. And uh, of course, a movie based on that would be pretty boring. So uh, they, uh, they have to uh, avoid reality. Uh, nonetheless, in our world, we have to put, take that into account. And so you very quickly go from um, the kind of interaction that we're doing right now to the moral equivalent of essentially sending emails with, with the video attachments and, and reading each other's or watching each other's videos or reading each other's email. So uh, we had to develop network management in a way that's consistent with this sort of high latency environment. That, that took us a while to fully sink in, uh, or it took a while to sink in fully. And, uh, and now, of course, we have a whole new uh, management suite that's part of the Bumble protocol uh, effort. Interesting. And you kind of have to forget everything you know about network management. So your pings and trace routes don't mean a thing yeah. when you're in a deep space, right? Because everything, by the time you get an answer, it might've changed five times and so forth. So yeah, you gotta they, reinvent the entire kind of uh, platform that you used to even test and check your things, right? So there is some good, there's some good news here though. Um, in the, uh, in the interplanetary system, a lot of the assets are likely to be in orbit somewhere, either in orbit, solar orbit, or in orbit around the moon or orbit around a planet. And those orbits are generally speaking predictable. And we can keep, we can keep refining our predictions by- like The ISS and all of these kind of uh, rovers in, in between, right? Well, uh, yes. And of course, think of all the thousands of satellites that are already in orbit around Earth. We have to know where they are in order to point our antennas at them in order to communicate. So we can make predictions. And that means that we can, we can estimate when it is uh, possible for communication to happen with any particular satellite, uh, that wherever it is in the solar system. And that allows us at least to plan for communication. So we have what's called contact graph routing. The contact graph is basically a schedule saying when you will be able to communicate with that particular satellite, either it's ready to receive from you or you're ready to transmit to it, or you want to receive from it and it will transmit to you. Or you have to keep in mind, however, that there is propagation delay from the time that you transmit to the time that the satellite will receive the signal, which means that you have to start transmitting before the satellite gets to where your signal is going to arrive later. So, so by, the, by that time the signal hits there, then the data can be, I mean, encapsulated well, and transferred. Yeah. It, 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 I mean, imagine that there's a satellite in orbit around Mars and you're going to throw a baseball to it. You have to throw the baseball in advance of the satellite getting to the right place to receive it. So you have to know when to throw the baseball and at what speed so that as the satellite comes around the planet, the baseball arrives. 
it's a little bit like Wayne Gretzky telling you, don't don't uh, skate where the puck is, skate where the puck is going to be. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that also applies for uh, uh, every other kind of type of sport, not just hockey. Yeah, right. <laughs> well, generally speaking, that's what you want. You want to be in place on time for something to happen as opposed to being there and arriving late. Yeah, definitely. That's also a lesson for life, right? <laughs> all, um, all right. So what's next for, for humanity? Um, how will we be communicating further out? For example, Alpha Centauri um, or other uh, distant planets? Well, and, uh, Alpha Centauri, of course, is a distant star. So now Sorry. we're talking interstellar communication. Uh, first, let me tell you uh, an anecdote about the predecessor to the Internet. The ARPANET was an experiment in packet switching that tested the idea of packet switching. And then once it was demonstrated successfully, it led to the Internet's design and development. But a guy named J.C.R. Licklider at MIT, <clears throat> who was the first um, uh, administrator of the Information Processing Techniques Office of ARPA, which did the ARPANET project or funded it, uh, and helped to do the, the design. Uh, Licklider, around 1962 or so, had this idea about using computers for non-numerical purposes. He was a psychiatrist or psychologist, and he believed that you could use computers to do other than just computation of, you know, ballistic trajectories and things like that. And so he had this idea about networking the computers together in order to share their resources and allow distant parties to collaborate with each other more effectively. So he wrote an email, or no, it wasn't an email because it was 1962, he wrote a letter uh, to his colleagues saying, let me tell you about my intergalactic network. Uh, and of course, tongue in cheek, of course, but two things are appropriate uh, to derive from this. The first one is that uh, he was uh, he was very um, foresightful in his thinking because obviously we now have the kind of network that he was imagining. Uh, it's not intergalactic yet. But we wanted to honor his memory and his and phraseology. So there is a Licklider transmission uh, protocol that allows, uh, it's like a layer two protocol for uh, space comms, and we named it after Lick. Uh, and then uh, we started speculating on whether we could, in fact, build a spacecraft uh, to visit Alpha Centauri, which is 4.3 light years away. Well, we actually went to the Lincoln Laboratory which has done lots of very important studies for the Defense Department. To do the uh, math, right? Uh, yes. So we said, can you help us do the math? And they came back with a report about a month later, uh, which, by the way, uh, was uh, delivered uh, in, a, in a video presentation to the Interplanetary Network Special Interest Group. And if you go to IPNC.org, you can see uh, that presentation where he shows us that we're 53 dB away from being able to e execute on a mission to Alpha Centauri and get anything useful back. So there's a lot of work to be done. Propulsion needs to be improved because with the current propulsion systems, it would take 76,000 years to get to Alpha Centauri from here. And that's kind of a long time for an experiment. <laughs> uh, and then there are all kinds of other problems, including pointing. Just think for a minute. You're 4.3 light years away from Earth, and you want to transmit a signal back to someplace in the solar system. You have to point the antenna to where the solar system is going to be 4.3 years later. Instead of the 20 minute thing for Mars, it's 4. A huge challenge to say the least. Well, how the hell do you calculate where the Earth is going to be? Remember, it's an orbit around the sun. The sun is an orbit around uh, the, uh, the center of our galaxy and the galaxy is moving around uh, along with the other 50 galaxies and, that are in this neighborhood. And so, we're yeah. in a universe that's constantly expanding, right? So take yes. that into consideration. Yes, although I would say over a four-year period, the expansion is probably not too severe. Uh, <laughs> nonetheless, yeah, you're correct. That's another uh, a, a Einsteinian effect, uh, which was unexpected. We didn't know. that the, We knew the universe was expanding. What we didn't know is that the rate of expansion is increasing. I mean, this is the this is the you know the WTF moment when somebody says, "Wait a minute, uh, you mean to tell me that there's something that's causing the galaxies to run away from each other?" And we don't know what it is. We gave it a name: dark energy. 
I have no idea what it is. And it, it, it amounts to something like 75% of the uh, of all of the matter and remember matter and energy are equivalent according to Einstein. So 75% of the mass of the universe is made up of dark energy. We don't know what it is, but you know, this is, if, if a kid says, what should I do? Tell him to go into astrophysics because we know about 5% of the universe, the normal matter and the antimatter. Then we have 20%, which is dark matter. We don't know what that is either. We gave it a name. It has gravity. That's all we know. And then we got uh, dark energy. You have, if you go into astrophysics, you have a high probability of getting the Nobel Prize because nobody knows anything. <laughs> yeah. It's definitely unmarked territory. And I mean, there's so much to learn. Uh, but that's, you know, that's science, right? That's science. Um, so, so, I mean, really baffling about, I mean, how far that is away. It's, I mean, literally, in, in different kind of that dimensions of, you know, um, actually, if you were in Alpha Centauri at the moment, you would, I mean, look into the past just to kind of communicate with Earth because it's so far away. Um, well, that's, happening, right? that's, that's why uh, astronomy is so weird, right? Because you look out and you see the stars and, and you think, well, this is beautiful right now, except what you're actually seeing is the past because it takes light a significant amount of time to reach us. As an example, the, um, the discovery of gravity waves, I think it was, I wanna say 2015, although I don't hold me to that. Uh, this is a big deal because Einstein predicted them over a hundred years ago, but we never had any instrumentation that was, was um, refined enough and sensitive enough to detect the gravity wave. And you might think, well, you know, wait a minute, uh, where did gravity waves come from? You say, well, how about the collision of two black holes? I mean, those are honking big, heavy things. And when they collide, space-time vibrates and, and, and it propagates outward, like dropping a rock in a pond and watching the ripples move out. The problem is that if the event occurred, you know, several tens of millions of light years away, by the time the signal gets to us tens of millions of years later, the ripple is about uh, the, the diameter of an atom. And so it, it's hard to detect. So you have to build these incredible detectors that are, you know, kilometers long in order to, uh, to use interfering um, uh, lasers to actually detect the, the shifting of space time if a gravity wave passes through the detector. So we actually were able to, uh, to detect that, but it was detecting an event that took place tens of millions of years ago. So astrophysics or astronomy is this weird uh, subject where what you're seeing is not now. In fact, the notion of now doesn't make any sense in the Einsteinian world because there isn't any now. Uh, well, it's local. Well, that's... Now is a local condition, but it is not a universal condition. Mm -hmm. So that's that's a, a really great explanation of that. I I have uh, my 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 explanation is much more simpler. I tell my daughter, if you're far enough from Earth and you look through a telescope in theory that will allow you to look into Earth, and you're far enough, you'll just see dinosaurs at the end of the on the other side. <laughs> well, it's true. It, if you it is true, right? That you'd have to be seventy five million light years away in order to see the dinosaurs. <laughs> and I think actually now that that you, you know, you're, if your daughter is studying science, she might ding you for that, because the universe is not that big yet. It's I don't believe that its, it's diameter is 75 million light years yet. So uh, we might have to double check that. <laughs> oh wait, no, no, I'm sorry. You said million years, and I'm thinking billion. Okay, sorry about that. The universe is 11 point some odd billion years old. And it's been expanding. It yeah, 13.8 or something, right? Uh, yes, 13.4, 13.8. But but it's been expanding uh, all that time. And so the actual diameter of the universe is much bigger. Maybe it's 38 billion light years. So you're right, 75 million light years away, which isn't all that far away. You could look back and see the dinosaurs. But, just like you said, like, astronomy is, is magnificent and it's weird at the same time, right? Yes. All right, so so moving on, um, I'm curious to ask you, what are the advantages and disadvantages of open sourcing the protocols of the internet? So on, on Earth also, but also 
um, like the interplanetary protocols, the bundle protocol, the DTN networking stack, for example? Well, when Bob Pound and I did the original internet design, we uh, reasoned our way to a conclusion that said, don't patent it and don't keep it secret, but make its design publicly available. So anyone who wishes to could build a piece of internet and find somebody to connect to. And there were, there were actually um, reasons for doing that. We wanted to make sure that we were doing this for the Defense Department, but we wanted to make sure that uh, our Defense Department and the Defense Department of Allied Nations could all interwork using the same protocols. And so sharing the design um, publicly was one way to do that. And you might say, well, why didn't you just share it with whoever was your current allies in 1973? And the answer is uh, the array of allies changes over time. If you look back during World War II, Russia was an ally. It certainly doesn't seem to be anymore today, for example. So we decided that in order to make sure that whoever were our allies at any point in time, that they would all have access to the internet design. So we released it publicly. The same argument uh, is uh, applies to the interplanetary protocols. We know that uh, many spacefaring nations and those who are anticipate becoming spacefaring nations will need, need to communicate with each other and in order to collaborate and cooperate in space and to coordinate their actions. And so we want them all to have the same set of protocols available so that communication is straightforward. And so we followed the same line of reasoning to reach the same conclusion. Interesting. All right, so I, I think that, that that covers that on, on the open sourcing. Um, so so working with NASA for space networking, what's like the biggest challenges that you think our species is facing right now? Oh my, okay, so uh, you- It's a you, big one, I know, it's a big one. Sort of like, describe the universe in 25 words or less, give three examples. Uh, <laughs> well, the obvious and huge uh, challenge for us is, is uh, climate change and global uh, and we have, have not yet done a very good job of responding to that. Uh, there are many things that we could do and should do, uh, even simple things like not rebuilding in places that are likely to be flooded increasingly often. Uh, that, that's a hard thing to decide because some people will lose uh, their property, for example, or lose value because they can't rebuild. Uh, but I think that's an important kind of, of um, policy that we need to adopt to say nothing of other kinds of policies to reduce our use of greenhouse gases or greenhouse gas producing uh, practices, including energy generation. Uh, California's shift, for example, to uh, insist on LEDs rather than uh, incandescent or uh, other kinds of uh, wasteful uh, energy wasting uh, light uh, forms uh, is a very important policy step to take. The same argument might be made for uh, electric cars, uh, although there the article, the argument will be, how, where does the electricity come from? Because the fact that the electric car doesn't generate greenhouse gas doesn't help very much if the electricity that was used to charge the battery was generated by systems that produce a lot of greenhouse gas. So these things have to you know, be done in coordination with each other. So that's probably the biggest uh, immediate challenge that there are uh, side challenges that arise from the global warming. One of them is food insecurity. We know that places that are currently uh, important bread baskets of the world may not be in the future if they run out of water, for example, or if the temperatures are so high that things won't grow. So we have uh, side challenges that show up as a consequence of uh, global warming. This, this, so that's probably one of the biggest problems we have. There's another problem we have, and frankly, it's us. Uh, our, our society is becoming increasingly dependent on technology. And when it doesn't work, uh, it creates fragile and brittle conditions. To give you a concrete example of that, if your mobile uh, is needed for two-factor authentication, but you can't get a signal or the battery is dead or something else goes wrong, then you can't get logged in. If you can't get logged in, you don't get the email that will make the big difference between success and failure in your business. And then you, you know, all kinds of cascade failures occur. So we are so dependent on that one technology 
that we really need to start thinking in terms of uh, how to create more resilience uh, in, in our dependencies. So looking at computing and communications as a key dependency in today's society, we need to ask ourselves, how do we make that more resilient? We do this at Google by, for example, replicating data across our data centers, which is why we have that big backbone network in order to link them together so we can, we can copy data from, from one place to another. So even if we lose a whole data center, nobody loses any data. So that's one kind of resilience. The other kind of resilience we might care about is the underlying uh, optical fiber networks that we build. Uh, we need to increase the connectivity of those networks so that when there are fiber cuts and things like that, we have the ability to route around them. Uh, we want to invest in the use of satellite communications as alternative comms, for, for example, the Starlink network that, uh, that Star and SpaceX is building. Uh, is an example of an additional uh, way of connecting uh, and keeping the internet connected. So all of those kinds of things also come to my mind when I worry about what's facing uh, the human race. Uh, definitely, and, and I mean, I, I think that it, it's super important to have these uh, backup and failsafe mechanisms already installed. Even for our external users, uh, Google always offers, for example, for you to carry some codes that in the, in the event that you can't trigger the two-factor, you could just pull up that code from your phone and use that, even if you don't have a signal, for example. So that's it's a pretty interesting, and that's definitely one of the biggest challenges that we have and we're facing. Um, so moving moving a little bit forward, um, what can we learn from uh, component, components that were created in the past but do not really scale well in the environment or under like a new requirement? You mentioned, for example, TCP IP and uh, as compared to the bundle protocol for, for space usage, which is like the biggest kind of challenges. Are there any other great examples in that area? Well, certainly there's a terrestrial one here at Google. Uh, some of our networking team came up with an alternative to TCP, which they call QUIC. Uh, in, because of the increasing use of cryptography for end-to-end -end, uh, protection of end-to-end -end communication and the push that we and others made to get from HTTP for the World Wide Web to HTTPS, which essentially was HTTP over TLS, over TCP over TLS, uh, or TLS over TCP. Um, the whole idea here was to see if we could combine some of that functionality in order to make it more resilient and to allow it to respond more quickly to uh, a disconnect. So the QUIC protocol does all the things that TCP does and the TLS does, and it allows multiple independently flow controlled channels within a given QUIC connection. Something I considered doing with TCP way back in 1973, but chose not to do at the time, partly because of the uh, amount of memory that would be required to to uh, handle the transmission control blocks from multiple channels of a single TCP connection. Remember, memory was expensive back then, so we didn't do that. Uh, so I'm happy to say that the, the quick guys have found a very powerful way of, uh, of an alternative to TCP TLS. And of course, we use that increasingly within our data centers, and more and more of that is taking place and being used outside in the public internet as well. It's definitely starting to kind of, uh, I wouldn't say become a, a de facto standard, but it is, I mean, slowly getting uh, more and more adoption. Okay, another great question that we have is uh, is around Web 3.0. So Web 3.0 is mainly about decentralization. So it's built, operated, and owned by its users. It focuses on content creators and based on block blockchain technology. So do you think um, it's an expected evolution of the organism that is the internet, or it's just a marketing wave uh, as an experiment, right? First of all, web one, two, and three are marketing terms. And so, and I kind of just, I'm a little dismissive of these things. I don't think anybody sat down and said, now I'm going to design web 3.0. Uh, in fact, I don't think that, that Tim Berners-Lee wrote down Web 1.0 either when he was doing his first design. It's organic, uh, right? In the evolution, it's kind of more organic. Well, it, it's constantly evolving, but I'm not persuaded, for example, that it's going to successfully reintroduce distribution. First of all, the Internet and, and the World Wide Web is, is distributed. I mean, there's, there's, I don't know how many bazillions of 
sites there are, but there are a lot. Now, many of them do rely increasingly on cloud-based architectures, but there's a reason for that. Those cloud-based architectures get the way they are because of an economy of scale. And we uh, find ourselves um, building larger and larger data centers because it doesn't take a, a linear number of people to run the data centers. We augment the people with automated systems. And so with the same number of people can build and operate a bigger and bigger data center. And then we replicate the data centers. So the data centers are distributed. And the, the, the argument about Web 3.0 being distributed has more to do with uh, who owns the data centers uh, and the computing equipment than it does with distribution in some sense. Um, I'm not persuaded that, uh, that a distributed system where my laptop is somehow serving the interests of other people is realistic. For, for one thing, when the laptop breaks, what happens to the data that's in it? Am I going to go to a lot of trouble to save everybody else's data, including my own? Uh, I don't think so. I don't have a strong motivation to do that necessarily. So I'm not persuaded that this Web 3.0 thing uh, has a lot going for it, partly because of the natural economy of scale that drives to concentration. Uh, there are uh, other arguments about control of information, uh, that, but I consider that to be a different matter. You should be able to control access to information that you feel that you own. Uh, and we can encourage and, and, and affect that without necessarily redistributing anything. It's just a question of giving people control over the crypto keys that, uh, that, that protects their information and let them decide to whom they offer uh, a decryption key. Uh, we already offer that capability at Google. It's called confidential computing. And so in some sense, we've already succeeded in, in implementing some of those things. It's true that we do offer uh, blockchain capability on the cloud, uh, although I don't believe that blockchain is magic. Uh, I don't, it's sort of like the 21st century bull cream. For anybody that remembers the 20th century commercials about uh, some kind of hair goo called bull cream that somehow made your love life better. Uh, of course, uh, I no longer worry about things like that because uh, <laughs> I don't have any hair. Um, the the whole point here is that i don't think blockchain is magic but in some cases it can be useful uh, when it's um, appropriately structured uh, and capable of managing the rate at which uh, blocks are formed which is a big issue because if you can't form the blocks at transaction speeds then it's not clear that the blockchain is helpful mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah definitely I, I i i agree with what you're saying i think that and time will, t will tell about, I mean, how this will actually come and, and get developed and rolled out. So we have time, I think, for one more, uh, one or two more questions. So how do you encourage uh, creative thinking with multiple teams that you're working with? So what is something that you kind of tend to do? Uh, I ask a lot of questions. Uh, and that turns out to be the fastest way of getting people to think. Um, and, and I'm not playing dumb, I am dumb. And it's amazing how much work people have to, uh, to go to in order to get me to understand something. But I find that by asking even naive questions that uh, you invite uh, people to consider how things work and why they work that way and whether they could work differently. Uh, that's where creativity comes from, challenging people. With this question, and you know, I just keep drilling down uh, until I get you know, hard answers that I can understand. That's a great, uh, great way to, to get that information, right? Sort of kind of what I'm doing to you right now with these 20 questions. <laughs> All right, for the last one, uh, who has had a, a tremendous impact on you as a leader? Well, there are several people that come to mind. Uh, my colleague, Robert Kahn, of course, uh, and I worked together literally since 1970. So you know, 50 years now plus. Uh, and my best friend, Steve Crocker, whom I met in high school uh, and with whom I worked at UCLA on the ARPANET project and later at uh, ICANN, and he succeeded me as, uh, as chairman of ICANN, for example. We both served at the Internet Society. Our, our paths and careers have interwoven for many, many years, and I consider him to be an enormous influence on me. Uh, so those, those two people are particularly come to my mind.
I guess I should say that uh, my seventh grade, no, fifth grade math teacher had a big influence on me too, because I remember complaining in the fifth grade that there must be more to math than addition, subtraction, multiplication, division, and fractions. And my teacher said, yes, that's right, and handed me a seventh grade algebra book when I was still in the fifth grade. And I went home and I did all the problems and I loved algebra. I loved uh, geometry because you got to prove stuff, you know, Q, <laughs> D. And so my teachers who got me excited about science and math, I really owe a lot to because that's German, the arc of my career. I think that's, that's uh, super insightful. And, and, you know, we could see how uh, um, a five grade teacher has that much impact on someone like you. So that's uh, very insightful. Um, all right, Vint, it was really great to have you here today with us. I uh, really appreciate the time. Super interesting. Um, I have 50 more questions, but we don't have time to cover all of these. <laughs> and uh, thanks very much for, for taking the time to talk with us today. Well, thank you very much, Ariel. It's always fun to have these kinds of discussions. I'll look forward to future ones. Excellent. All right.